In any dental school, we do not get enough time to teach everything that is important in the clinical practice. We just don't have enough time. We teach the most important anatomic landmarks. In the University of Minnesota, we get about 70 hours of lecture time for radiology. Even with these 70 hours of lecture time, we have to skip some information. Today, I have the opportunity to talk to all of you about some of the lesser known canals and foramina. Obviously, the question is, why should we know the lesser known canals and foramina? Many of these canals and foramina are important anatomic landmarks which play crucial roles in the health of the patient. Some of these canals and foramina are important for implant placement or for other surgical reasons. So let's start with some of these anatomic variations. I thought that I'll talk to you about these seven anatomic variations. First, I'll talk to you about mandibular incisive canal. Then I'll go to a mental foramina. Remember, I'm not saying mental foramen. I'm saying mental foramina. So I'll show you examples of multiple foramina in the mental foramen region. Then we'll go to retromolar canal, nasopalatine canal, canalis sinusus, infraorbital canal, and zygomatic facial foramen. Let's start with mandibular incisive canal. The mandibular incisive canal is in the midline. It can be lingual, can be labial. Many times these are right at the midline. Sometimes they are around the premolars or little farther posteriorly. So we call these our paramedian or posterior. So here is on a cross section, we can see what are the locations of these canals. So this would be the primary inferior alveolar canal and here would be the mental foramen and there is an accessory branch on the anterior and we may have a canal coming to the lingual. Canals may be on the buccal towards the labial cortical plate. There may be some canals here going from posterior towards anterior or from anterior towards posterior and there could be some in, even in the posterior region. So I'm going to show you a CBCT scan of a patient with a few missing teeth. And this is an axial section. The axial section is as if you are standing at the foot of the patient. This is the mandible. This is the outline of the symphysis area. And that's the softish outline of the chin. And here, this discontinuity on the buccal cortical plate, that's the left mental foramen. And this would be the right mental foramen. So I'm going to look in this area on this particular window. So I'm going to look at this area because this is where we may have the mandibular incisive canal. So I'm going to get a reference point right here. And this is the cross section. And maybe I'll make it a little larger so that you can see the image better. So here we are. This is the mandibular incisor. That's the maxillary incisor. This is the buccal cortical plate. And that's the lingual cortical plate. And what we can see here, here is one canal. Here is another canal. And there is a canal on the buccal cortical plate. So as you go anterior to posterior, you can see that this, there are three different canals. If I move superiorly, and let me take the blue line away. And that's the foramen and the canal. So the one that we are seeing is going towards the lingual cortical plate. You can see here is another canal. Right here is another canal on the labial cortical plate. And this is the mental foramen. So that's the canal on the labial cortical plate. Maybe we can try to identify it on this image right here. So this is the area of the canal on the buccal cortical plate or the labial cortical plate. So there can be multiple canals in the mandibular anterior region. So we saw on on the lingual. So the cross section is the image here. If we go further down, further inferiorly, we might be able to pick this canal. So let's try that. 
I think we are in the area. So let me move the blue line. And that's the canal on the labial cortical plate right at the midline. And here we can see is the canal. So here is one extra canal. Those are the two mental foramina. So what is the importance of learning about the mandibular incisive canal? The most important is during implant placement. Many times the symphysis region is used to harvest bone for grafting. And if you have a blood vessel on the labial cortical plate, you might damage that area. And that could continue to bleed. And because it's a neurovascular canal, the patient may continue to experience pain. If you have a resorbed mandible and you are going to place an implant, you should be careful about the mandibular anterior region because you might be perforating extra neurovascular canals in the mandibular anterior area. I would recommend that if you have time, read this paper published in 2011, Evaluation of the Location and Dimensions of Lingual Foramina Using Limited Cone Beam Computed Tomography. And this paper will describe a lot of information that you might find beneficial for your clinical practice. Let's move to our next condition. And we are going to talk about mental foramina. We all know about mental foramen. And we are going to show you today about multiple mental foramen. So let's again go to a CBCT scan and identify multiple mental foramina. So let's look at this patient who has multiple mental foramina. And I'm using a software called On Demand 3D. And the software is very good for a 3D reconstruction. And already before I'm going through the panoramic reconstructed image or the axial slice or the coronal slices or the sections, I can already see on the 3D reconstruction that this patient has multiple mental foramina. So you see here, there are three mental foramina. So we need to identify if these three foramina are arising from the inferior alveolar canal. We can also see that there are some anterior mandibular canal or incisive mandibular incisive canals. And then we may have a canal here or foramen, one foramen here. These two are other foramina. And we want to see if these two are also arising from the mandibular canal. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a cross section in the premolar region. So this is first premolar, second premolar. So let me take a reference point and this is our first premolar. So I'm going to make a cross section here. Keep this image as large as possible. So this is the mandibular bone, mandibular premolar. This is the lingual cortical plate. That's the buccal cortical plate. And I think this patient has some mandibular torus, tori. And you can see that these are the mandibular tori as we see on the axial slice. So let me keep this image a little larger as well. So magnify this. So I'm going posteriorly on this image. And if you follow the blue line here, that represents the image here. So this blue vertical line is telling me the image here. This blue horizontal line is telling me where I have this image. And so I'm going through the roots of the premolars and that's what I'm seeing here. This is the root of the premolar. And so again, this line also represents this image. This line and this line mean the same thing. So I'm going posteriorly and here is a mantle foramen. So that's the buccal cortical plate. And on the buccal cortical plate, we have a discontinuity. So that's the mantle foramen. And then we see that there is the other foramen coming here. So this one is this particular one. So we have one foramen coming from here. So this was the man mandibular canal. From the mandibular canal, one canal is coming here. Let me scroll back. And that's the primary canal. This is the accessory canal. And let's go a little distal. And we see here is another canal. So this is the third canal. So there are three canals on this side. One, two, and three. So there are three mental foramina on this side. 
And for the sake of interest, let's look at this area. So I'm going to go through, th this is K9, first premolar, second premolar. And if I line up with the second premolar, I should be able to see the first pre mental foramen. So that's the main mental foramen. So if I go mesially, and let's go mesially and see, here is the foramen. And I don't see this one arising from the inferior alveolar canal. Okay, so that's the mental foramen. And further distally, we might be able to see another canal. It's a small one, probably we do not see that. Yeah, right here. So that's the other canal. Let's see what we have in the mandibular anterior region. Maybe there are canals. So this patient has one canal here, another canal on the inferior. So there are two canals. Here is a labial canal that we saw here. This canal is here, that's the lingual canal. So there could be multiple canals in the mandibular anterior region. So we have to be very careful when we place an implant. So that's the lingual cortical plate. That's the labial cortical plate. On the lingual, we have two canals. In a few minutes, we'll go and review about retromolar canal. And I think we have a retromolar canal on this side. So I'm going to make this slice very thin and see if I can see something. So right now the tissue volume, the slice volume is 20 millimeter. I'm going to make it one millimeter. So that's a one millimeter thin slice. So this is our primary canal. And here is an retromolar canal, an accessory canal coming here. See, that's the other canal. So the canal is bifid here. See, there are one canal here, one canal coming this way in ending in the uh, trabecular bone, and that's the other canal. So this one would be classified as a retromolar canal. So, so I have shown you a patient with three mental foramina on the right side. There can be three, there can be two, there can be one, and sometimes a foramen can be completely missing. So I have another patient here, and this is the patient's left side. We see the mental foramen here on the 3D reconstruction. And as I go to the other side, the canal seems blocked or very narrow. So the canal should have been here. And let's see if we can identify the canal here. I see a depression, but not the same prominent foramen as we see on the left side. So let's take a reference point and go from the premolar on this side, keep the image large. So this is the left mental foramen. This is the buccal cortical plate. This is the lingual cortical plate and we have the mental foramen here. And we can see the mental foramen is here. This is the area of the mental foramen, but the buccal cortical plate appears to be overlaying the foramen. So this foramen is open. And let's go to the other side. I'll go to the area of the canine. So this is the canine. And then I'll go distally, trying to identify the mental foramen. So that's the lingual cortical plate. This is the buccal cortical plate. And I'm going to go very slowly, try to identify so that maybe the inferior alveolar canal this is the buccal cortical plate and what you are looking for a discontinuity on the buccal cortical plate. So help me if I can identify a mental foramen. So that's where the mental foramen should exit. And it seems that there is a buccal cortical plate. So there is no opening the way we saw it on the other side. So if we go to the other side, this was the discontinuity. And if we go here, there is no discontinuity. So what does this mean? If you are going to put local anesthesia in this area, you may not be able to achieve any anesthetic effect because the bone covering has blocked the mental foramen. Right? So this is absence of a mental foramen. So we have just reviewed mental foramina. 
we saw that there could be more than one or two or three mental foramina. And we also saw that there could be an absence of mental foramina as well. So what's the frequency of multiple mental foramina? There are several publications. Some report that this is around 2% of the population to more than 20%. This is probably not correct. We have to have mental foramina when there are additional foramen arising from the mandibular canal. In one example, we saw that there were two foramina on the buccal cortical plate on the left side, but this did not appear to be arising from the mandibular canal. So in that case, that does not fulfill the criteria of mental foramen or mental foramina. So this number may not be correct. The number is around 2% to 7 or 8%. That's what most of the publications report. Some patients have bilateral multiple mental foramina and there could be absence of mental foramina or absence of mental foramen and we saw that. The clinical importance for multiple mental foramina is when you are trying to get a local anesthesia or in case of surgery in the area of the premolars, we should be aware of presence of multiple mental foramina. If we're going to place an implant in the premolar region, again the location of the mental foramen or multiple mental foramina plays a crucial role. I have two suggestion papers for you detection and characterization of accessory mental foramen using cone beam computed tomography. And this one is a study of about 4000 CBCT scan for the prevalence of accessory mental foramina. I had shown you one case of retromolar canal and maybe we can continue with discussing about retromolar canal. Let's start with a panoramic radiograph. Then I'll try to identify another CBCT scan to show you retromolar canal. So here on this panoramic radiograph, we can see that this is the primary canal and here is a curvature and that's the retromolar canal. So we have first molar, second molar, third molar is missing and here is a retromolar canal. Retromolar canal could be vertical, could be horizontal, could be straight could be at an angle so there could be different orientations. Most of the retromolar canals are vertical on the distal aspect of the third molar. It can be horizontal and can be bifid mandibular canal. The importance of knowing about retromolar canal is during third molar extraction. Also in the third molar region we frequently cyst and benign tumors like an odontogenic keratocyst or an amyloblastoma. In, in such cases, it's important to know if there is an accessory canal. Also, external oblique ridge is a frequent site for graft harvesting. So if you are planning to harvest graft from the third molar area on the buccal cortical plate, you have to evaluate the radiographs to identify if you are violating any accessory retromolar canal. These are two papers that I would suggest you to read, a retromolar canal and its variation, classification using cone beam computed tomography, and radiographic study of mandibular retromolar canal, an anatomic structure with clinical importance. So at this time, let's go and review a CBCT scan to look at retromolar canal. So let me use this CBCT scan to show you an example of a retromolar canal. We have a patient with a CBCT scan of the mandibular arch only. On this software, which is on demand 3D, I have created this reconstructed panoramic radiograph of the mandible with a tissue thickness of 20 millimeter. For our evaluation of this area, that's the third molar area, we have first molar, second molar, and third molar area. And I know that there is a retromolar canal, so I'm going to show it to you by making this panoramic reconstruction with a thin slice. So currently I have thickness at 20 millimeter. I'm going to make it say about one millimeter. So it's a very thin slice. So that's how a very thin slice looks like. What I'm going to do, I'm going to make this image a little larger so that we all can see it better. So this is the magnified view. 
this is the left inferior alveolar canal and I can change my positions here and maybe I can see the canal a little better yes so you can see that I'm picking up the canal a little better this is the left mental foramen that's the right mental foramen we have inferior alveolar canal on the right side first molar second molar third molar area third molar was extracted and here from this canal we have an accessory branch coming and moving vertically up so that's the retromolar canal here let's see how we can uh, see this canal on a coronal slice so i'm going to take a reference point and put a slice here so the canal is in this area i know that it's covered by the reference point or the cross here so what i'm going to do i'm going to remove the reference line and we'll see it better so this is the buccal cortical plate of the ramus so we are in this area maybe we can make the image bigger so that's the vertical retromolar canal this is the inferior alveolar canal this is the buccal cortical plate and that's the lingual cortical plate I don't think I have a retromolar canal on the left side. Maybe I do, a very small one. So let's take a reference point here. And if I can see, yes, that's the foramen exiting on the alveolar crest in the third molar area. So again, this is mandibular left first molar, mandibular left second molar, third molar is missing. And we have a retromolar canal here somewhat zigzag appearance and then we had a better canal on the right side so this would be the retromolar canal let's move to the maxillary arch and learn about nasopalatine canal as you know nasopalatine canal is also known as an incisive canal so this is a common knowledge for all the dental students you already know about this landmark so let's review a nasopalatine canal, a normal canal first, and then we are going to review a nasopalatine duct cyst. Right? So let's go to a CBCT scan and look at the normal nasopalatine canal. So we have a CBCT scan of the both the arches, and to save our time, I'm just going to go through the midline of the maxilla to identify the nasopalatine canal. So I'm going to select a reference point right at the midline and here is the nasopalatine canal or incisive canal so this is a maxillary central incisor that's the labial cortical plate and in the palatal aspect we have a nasopalatine canal so in this case the canal is narrow on the top and wide at the bottom and this is a variation of normal canal in a few moments i'm going to show you different variations of nasopalatine canal so on the axial slices this is where the canal looks like let me remove the reference lines and we can see the canal a little better so this is the nasopalatine foramen as we go up superiorly that's the nasopalatine canal this is maxillary right central incisor this is maxillary left central incisor so that's the nasopalatine canal we are looking at the heart palate now this is the right maxillary sinus and that's the left maxillary sinus so nasopalatine canal may have different cross-sectional appearance and these are the four common appearance one is a cylindrical which means from the top to the bottom superior to the inferior the canal has uniform width so we'll call this as a cylindrical nasopalatine canal so this is one type of normal canal appearance the second type is an hourglass appearance wider on the inferior aspect wider on the superior aspect and narrow at the central part so we'll call this as an hourglass nasopalatine canal example that we just saw is a funnel shaped nasopalatine canal where the canal is wider at the inferior aspect and narrow at the superior aspect then we have a variation of normal nasopalatine canal known as spindle shaped where the superior part is narrow inferior part is narrow and on the central part it's little wider so we have a curvature of the anterior wall 
curvature of the posterior wall. So this is a normal variation. This is the most difficult one because these curvatures may be the early stage of a nasopelatin duct cyst formation. So let's continue with another CBCT scan and identify a nasopelatin duct cyst and the appearance of that. So here we have an example of a nasopelatin duct cyst. This patient had a maxillary CBCT scan. The area of interest is obviously the nasopelatin canal. So you can obtain only one arch of the CBCT scan. So I'm going to start from the canine region. So let me take a reference point. Here is the canine. So that's the canine here. And I'll keep the images little larger here and maybe make this one a little larger too. So coming mesially, we picked up the lateral incisor. So this blue line represents this cross section here. This blue line or this blue line represents the image here. So the image, this image is going through the middle third of the roots of the incisors. And we are in the lateral incisor area. So coming anteriorly, mesially, we picked up the central incisor. And here is the nasopelatin canal. So this is the superior margin, superior border of the canal. This is the inferior part. Anterior wall is slightly curved. Posterior wall is also slightly curved. So currently this looks more like a spindle shaped nasopelatin canal. But let's review the whole scan. And you can see that it's becoming wider. So here it's much wider. That's the area of number nine, the left central incisor. And this is the nasopelatin duxis. That's the superior part of the canal, normal. And we go further. And then we come between central and lateral incisor. So this is the interradicular area. The cyst has extended to the labial cortical plate. Labial cortical plate is thin and expanded. So now we are missing the labial cortical plate. That's the canal and here is the cyst. So we are towards the distal part of the lateral incisor and we pick up the canine. So our blue line is going through the roots, not going to the cyst. See cyst is here, so I'm going to move this blue line superiorly and see on the axial slices, the size of the cyst. So that's the nasopelatin duct cyst uh, extending between the roots of the lateral and the central incisor. So that's the nasopelatin duct cyst and we can see on the 3D reconstruction, the labial cortical plate is thin or missing. So initially we saw a spindle shaped nasopelatin canal, but it continued to become a full fledged nasopelatin duct cyst, not at the midline, but towards the left side. So it's not necessarily that the nasopelatin duct cyst would be right at the midline of the maxilla. It can be towards the right side or towards the left side. And in our case, we saw the cyst was towards the left side, went between the central and lateral incisor and almost reach the canine. So clinical importance of knowing about nasopelatin canal is obviously nasopelatin duct cyst. Sometimes a nasopelatin duct cyst may be confused with a periapical lesion and I'm going to show you an example uh, where a nasopelatin duct cyst looked like a periapical lesion. And obviously, when you are placing an implant in the maxillary anterior region, you should be aware of nasopelatin canal and the size of the canal and where it, it is located. So this patient had history of trauma to the anterior teeth. This tooth appears calcified canal. So we have a normal canal here. And this canal is almost sclerosed and we have a periapical radiolucency. With a periapical radiograph, this is how it looks like. Here is this lesion and we can see that the PDL space is intact. So the tooth was vital, although the pulp canal was closed. And this is the nasopelatin duct cyst. So let me show you the CBCT scan of the same patient to see that these two are different lesions. So this is the CBCT scan of the same patient. And we have this tooth with sclerosed pulp canal. And here we can see that the pulp canal is sclerosed. So here we can see that the pulp canal is sclerosed. 
apex is slightly flattened and the lesion is here so this is no way related to the tooth and this is actually nasopalatine duct cyst so that's the superior part of the canal and inferiorly here is the cyst so this cyst is also not at the midline this is central incisor that's central incisor the cyst is not at the midline the cyst was towards the right side almost looked like a superimposed over the root of the right central incisor so knowing the relationship of the tooth and the nasopalatine canal is very important in ruling out a cyst of odontogenic origin and a cyst of nasopalatine canal so for further reading i'm recommending these papers morphologic changes of the nasopalatine canal related to dental implant placement anatomy and morphology of the nasopalatine canal using cone beam computed tomography in this paper the nasopalatine canal in adults on cone beam computed tomograms these three papers also talk about the classification of normal nasopalatine canal let's continue with another maxillary anterior region canal less known but very important and that's called canalis sinusus a canalis sinusus is a canal originating from the infraorbital nerve it's a branch that continues as anterior superior alveolar nerve and then supplies the anterior part of the maxilla so this is how it looks like on a cadaver so here we have the infraorbital canal so that would be the infraorbital nerve and there is a branch the branch comes here as anterior superior alveolar canal and then releases several branches here so this could be bilateral they are not exactly the same location they are in different areas the knowledge of this canal and its branches are very important for placing implants in the region as well as for endodontic procedures so let's review a CBCT scan to understand the concept of canalis sinusus. We have a patient with a maxillary CBCT scan who wants to have an implant in the maxillary central incisor area in the area of tooth number nine. So the patient has orthodontic brackets and wires and this is the edentulous region and that is being planned for implant placement. So let's go with the reference point at the edentulous region. So that's the labial cortical plate and here is the nasopalatine canal. As we go distally, we see another canal here, right at the area of the proposed implant site. So let me show you on this view. Now we have a 10 millimeter thick slice and I'm going to make it as thin as possible, maybe about one millimeter. So the canal is here and it's here so that's the canal coming towards the edentulous region near the buccal cortical plate and here is the exit on this side we can see the canal let's see if i can pick it up that's the canal so this is the wall of the nasal fossa floor of the nasal fossa this is the maxillary sinus and this canal is close to the sinus and it's known as canalis sinusus and it goes anteriorly so this is a good example to show you that in the edentulous region where the implant is being planned here is an accessory canal let me remove the reference line so that you can see the canal better so this is the canal right in contact with the labial cortical plate so you should be aware of presence of a fairly large prominent neurovascular canal it's here and you can see that it's almost as wide as the inferior alveolar canal it's a very large canal it's right in this area so again reviewing the position of the canalis sinusus originating from the infraorbital canal and close to the maxillary sinus and exiting into the maxillary anterior region and there could be several branches of the canalis sinusus or anterior superior alveolar canal so these are the different papers that i am recommending you for further reading anterior superior alveolar nerve and this is a detailed review done in 2015 these two papers are for evaluating canalis sinusus a study of 1000 cases and this is a paper that talks about 
effects of implant placement in the areas with neurovascular anatomic variation. So the canal is sinusus originates from the infraorbital canal. So let's review the infraorbital canal a little bit. It could be a canal only, it could be a groove only, so there is no wall, or it could be a combination of the canal and the groove. So this is how it may look like on a coronal section. The infraorbital canal could be inside the bone or partially protruded into the maxillary sinus. So this would be the maxillary sinus cross section or fully protruded. So let's go and review a scan that shows the infraorbital canal and the foramen. So we are going to review a scan of the maxillary anterior region to identify the infraorbital canal in infraorbital foramen. So I'm in the area of the premolars, so I'm coming anteriorly. And let me show you one more canal before we keep going to the other area. So that's the orbit and that's the nasolacrimal canal. Today we are not going to spend any time on talking about nasolacrimal canal, but here it is. So your eyeball is here, nasolacrimal canal drains to the nasal fossa. So when you cry, your teardrops go through this canal and it comes to the nose. So when you cry, your nose runs. So that's the reason. So that's the nasolacrimal canal. So I'm going distally and this is the floor of the orbit. That's the superior border of the orbit. And here is the infraorbital canal and we just Across the infraorbital foramen. This is an important landmark because we put local anesthesia for the anterior region in this uh, foramen area. So as we go distally, you can see that the canal becomes compressed and narrow and almost disappears, but the canal is still there. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to show you on the sagittal slices. So this is sagittal slice. This is a coronal view, and that's the axial view. On the sagittal view, that's the foramen, and this is the canal. So the canal here, we have a canal wall, and there is no wall, so this is a groove, and that's the wall. So this is a combination of canal and a groove. So that's the anterior part of the inferior orbital foramen, and this is the distal part. And so that's how the infraorbital canal looks like, superior to the wall of the maxillary sinus. While we are with this patient, maybe I can show you a few more landmarks. And it's good to keep this image big. So the infraorbital foramen is here. This is supraorbital foramen. And you can see that this patient has two supraorbital foramen. So that's again a variation of normal. This is single. That's what we had learned in the dental school of one supraorbital foramen. And but on this patient, we have two. As we complete the discussion about infraorbital canal, maybe we can use this scan to learn about another foramen. So, and this is this foramen. So that's the zygomatic bone. This is the zygomatic of frontal suture. So that's the frontal bone. This is the zygomatic bone. That's the zygomatic of frontal suture. This is the zygomatic of temporal suture here, zygoma and temporal bone, zygomatic or temporal suture. And that's the maxilla. And this is the zygoma. So this is the zygomatic maxillary suture. And on the anterior aspect of the zygoma is a zygomatic facial foramen. And with this landmark, but before doing that, let's review a few more slides. So in our case, we saw canal which was completely embedded, at least in the anterior part, and then distally it became a groove. So let me go back one slide. We mentioned about a canal only, a groove only, and a combination of canal and a groove. And in our case, we saw on the distal part and in the anterior part, it was a canal. And on the center, the superior wall of the canal was missing. So we'll call that as a groove. So this is a combination. So that could be an appearance. Again, importance of knowing about infraorbital foramen and infraorbital canal is for local anesthesia and also for orbital fracture and repair. So this is a paper that I would recommend if you have time to read characteristic and dimensions of the infraorbital canal and radiographic analysis using cone beam CT. So the last 
One, I have already shown you a 3D reconstruction of zygomaticofacial foramen. And zygomaticofacial foramen is, arises from the zygomatic nerve. When it reaches the orbit, it divides into two branches. It's called zygomaticotemporal branch and zygomaticofacial branch. And again, the clinical importance of this canal or the foramen is for zygomatic fracture. And knowledge of this is important for placing an implant, a zygomatic implant. These are the two papers that I am recommending. Anatomical study of zygomaticofacial foramen and its related canal and frequency and location of the zygomaticofacial foramen and its clinical importance in zygomatic implants. With this, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed and you learned a few landmarks that are not common knowledge in the dental school curriculum. Thank you.